All right, so when we, when we talk about systolic function, you have to have a very clear understanding of what we're talking about. So remember, the heart is a muscular pump, and we talk about a systolic function. That's when the heart contracts, and then we have a diastolic function when the heart relaxes and fills fill with blood. So we can separate those two functions. Uh, we can look at the systolic function, that's when the heart contracts, and then we can look at the diastolic function when it relaxes. Um, you must have heard that patients with heart failure uh, have equal, uh, you know, they're, they're equal in terms of systolic and diastolic function. So, you know, we used to think that heart failure means LV systolic dysfunction. That means the systolic function is abnormal. But we now know that uh, the diastolic function is just as important. As a matter of fact, the older you get, the proportion of patients with heart failure um, um, they, they tend to have more diastolic dysfunction. But we're going to do LV systolic function um, today, and then the next session we'll, we'll, well, we have to do a few things first before we move into uh, LV diastolic uh, uh, function and dysfunction. So we're going to look at the methods that we use to uh, evaluate LV systolic function. And the first one we're going to look at is ejection fraction. All right. We'll tell you exactly what that is. We're going to look at fractional shortening, wall motion score index, stroke volume, cardiac output, uh, uh, M mode uh, feature we call the mitral valve E point septal separation. And then we look at, uh, we will touch on coronary artery distribution. So all these things are very important for your future echo career because you have to understand these things fully. Um, right, let's just move on. All right. So when, when, again, when we talk about cardiac function, what's the purpose of the, the heart? The, the heart is just a pump, okay, and it pump out a certain amount of uh, blood per minute. If it's not doing that, then it's failing as a pump. Okay, and as as we have mentioned before, the the the, the failure of the heart as a pump can be either systolic, diastolic, or a combination of both. Okay, again, systolic function is when the heart contracts and pumps blood out, and then diast diastolic function is when the heart relaxes and fills with blood. So if there is a problem with any of those uh, function, the heart as a pump, the amount of blood that it pumps out is going to be reduced. And initially, that's more evident when someone exerts themselves. Because if you exert yourself and the cardiac output cannot uh, increase, the amount of blood that the heart pumps out cannot increase to match the, 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 the demand, then you're going to be symptomatic, okay? All right, so, so let's concentrate a little bit on LV systolic function. That is, you know, how well the heart is contracting. Uh, and this is very important because when you have any insult to the heart, uh, the first thing we, we look at is what is the ejection fraction. So... We use the ejection fraction essentially to, to prognosticate, to say how well this patient is going to do, okay? Because if you have any insult, say you have a heart attack, a myocardial infarction, and the ejection fraction reduced to 20%, you, you, you automatically know that that individual is going to do poorly uh, short-term and long-term. So a, a, the ejection fraction is a good assessment uh, of how the patient is going to do. It's very good in terms of uh, pro prognosticate, to prognosticate. All right, so the methods that we're going to use to evaluate LV systolic function is ejection fraction, fractional shortening, wall motion score index, mitral valve E point, uh, septal separation, stroke volume, and cardiac output. Again, 
these assessments are extremely important, so you have to understand them fully. Um, so the, 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 the classic definition for ejection fraction, so the, as the name suggests, it's, you know, the fraction of blood that's pumped out from the heart. But, but, but what's the, the, the exact definition, okay? It is, all right, if, if you look at the heart, there is a, there is a, a diastolic volume and a systolic volume. So when the heart fills with blood and it fills to its maximum, that's what we call the end diastolic volume. When the heart contracts and pumps blood out, you know, you can either use the left ventricle or the right ventricle. So when the heart contracts and pumps blood out, the blood remaining inside of the LV cavity on the left side, the, the blood remaining in the, the, the left ventricle is what we call the end systolic volume. So when the heart fills, you have an end diastolic volume. When it contracts and pumps blood out, you have an end systolic volume. So if some, if by some means you could get the end diastolic volume, measure it, and you subtract from that the end systolic volume, then that, it, that tells you how much blood was pumped out in absolute number. And if you divide that by the end diastolic volume then it's give the it gives you the fraction of blood that was pumped out so essentially the ejection fraction is just a fraction of blood that was pumped out and and that's a, a very good measure of how well the heart is contracting okay again the end diastolic volume that's when the heart fills with blood uh, at the end of diastole and then end systolic volume. So the, the, the blood has already been pumped out of, of the left ventricle and the blood remaining. So if you subtract from the end diastolic volume, the end systolic volume, you get the absolute volume of blood that was pumped out. And if you divide it by the end diastolic volume, you get the fraction of blood that was pumped out uh, from the LV. So this formula is very important and this formula gives you the ejection fraction. You have to know the formula. So memorizing the formula is not the way to go. You have to understand what, what it's saying, okay? And so, so, you know, just memorizing it, it's not, you can, you can f f forget the formula, but you have to understand what's happening. So in end diastole, the heart fills with blood, in end systole, the heart pumps blood out, and it's the, the volume of blood that remains inside the heart at the end of systole, okay? So the method that we use to assess uh, volumes in, in echo is called the modified Simpson's rule or the biplane method of disk. On all exam, this simple term appears on all exam because they, they want you, you know, what is the method that you use to assess LV volumes and ends ejection fraction? We use the, the modified Simpson's, or, uh, Simpson's rule or the biplane method of this. Simpson was a, a mathematician who did uh, works on, on volume using, he, he came up with some, a complex mathematical formula to, to, to determine volumes. What we use in ECHO is a modified form of that. Uh, the other method is the biplane method of disk. So if you if you if you cut if you cut the um, the LV uh, volume into small smaller volumes and you add them together, then you get the overall volume. So this is essentially the biplane method of disk. Okay, so you have your apical four chamber view. So to get the ejection fraction using echo, you need to get your apical four chamber view, preferably. And to get your diastolic volume, you have to do what we call planimetry. You find the endocardial border. 
So the endocardial border, that is the interface between the, 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 the endocardium or the muscle and the, the blood, okay? And you can see that when you do your apical four chamber view. So it's very important to see the endocardial border. And those of you who was in the, the, the contrast lecture, if you're not seeing the endocardial border clearly, properly, you can do microbubble contrast to clearly delineate this. So you can plane with planimetry, use planimetry to plane the endocardial border in diastole, in diastole, okay? And we want end diastole. So at the, the, uh, we, you know, we, when you, your ECG is on the bottom and we use the onset of the QRS complex as end diastole, the onset of the QRS complex. So your marker is gonna be at the onset of the QRS and you shouldn't look at your image to confirm that it's diastole. So diastole in the mitral valve is gonna be opened, okay? And hopefully the cavity size is gonna be maximum in, in, in diastole. So you do planimetry, you just plane the endocardial border and you have to see clearly. So, you know, if, if your regular two-dimensional echo is not affording you the ability to, to, to see the endocardial border clearly, then that's an indication for microbubble contrast. So you do planimetry, okay? You plane the endocardial border. When you get down to the mitral valve plane, you, you, it should be um, a straight line, and then you, you just complete it and then you drop a perpendicular from the apex down to the base. You can see that what, what it does, it divides the, 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 the left ventricular volume into these discs. So it cuts it up into discs and then hides them up, okay? The computer will do all the work for you. So you, it gives you a left ventricular area, okay? So areas in centimeter squared. It gives you the major axis, which is from the apex down to the base, and it gives you a volume. You know, it gives you a volume. So this is the, your end diastolic volume, okay? And you do the same thing for your end systolic volume. So systole, we say, is at the peak of the um, T wave. So your marker should be at the peak of the T wave, and you're gonna get a smaller volume in systole because now the LV has contract and pump a certain amount of blood out, so the blood remaining in the LV cavity is gonna be much less. And in systole, the mitral valve is closed, the aortic valve is open, is open. so you do the same thing. You plane the endocardial border, make sure you see it clearly, okay? You plane the border, when you get to the base, it should be a straight line, and then you drop your, your uh, perpendicular to the base down, and it divides it into these uh, uh, disc, multiple discs, by plane uh, method of disc, modified Simpson rule, okay? And it gives you a volume. So if the computer didn't give you an ejection fraction, you can calculate an ejection fraction because the definition of ejection fraction is end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume divided by the end diastolic volume. And that's your ejection fraction. You know, you should always do this on all your patients. Okay. So this is something that should be done. So these are some typical uh, values and range. It's the, the usual end diastolic volume is about 120 mLs, uh, but it ranges from about 65 to 240. Okay, your end systolic volume is about 50, uh, typical, but it ranges from 16 to 143 mLs. Stroke volume, so another uh, term we're gonna introduce. Stroke volume, is the volume of blood that's pumped out from your LV per beat. Uh, 
So it is the volume of blood that pumps out from the LV per beat. So it is essentially your end diastolic volume minus your end systolic volume. Stroke volume, the volume that pump out of the heart or the LV per beat. And then ejection fraction is your end diastolic volume minus your end systolic volume divided by the end diastolic volume. And we will get to cardiac output. So cardiac output is the volume of blood that pump up per minute. Okay, so it is the volume that's pumped out of the, the, the LV per minute. So we know the, the volume that pump out per beat is 70. So essentially, the cardiac output is the stroke volume times the heart rate. Remember, the heart rate is the, 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 the number of beats per minute, and cardiac output is the volume per minute. So if we have the volume per beat, stroke volume, and we multiply it by the heart rate, we get the cardiac output. So you can use echo to, to, to get your cardiac output and your stroke volume and all that sort of stuff. So this, this, this is an, an exercise. So if the end diastolic volume is 120, end systolic volume is 50, stroke volume is 70, and then your end diastolic volume is 120. So ejection fraction is 70 over 120. 0.58, which is 58%. So even though we talk about ejection fraction, and a fraction is point something up to one, we usually represent it in, in, in a percentage. And the normal ejection fraction is about 55 to 70%, okay? It's a very good tool to prognosticate, okay? Remember, when, when there's any insult to the heart, there's a tendency for the ejection fraction to, 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 to fall. Now, another term we're going to uh, introduce is fractional shortening. So we used to use this you know, quite a bit um, some time ago, but um, you know, we're not using it as much now, but you'll, you'll still get it in your exam. And they, they expect you to know what it is, what's the range. So when we talk about fractional shortening, it, it, it's essentially the same thing. You're looking at the heart, and the heart is going to contract. So it's going to shorten. Okay. When the heart contracts, the wall's moving. So it shortens, essentially. So it is the percentage change in the left ventricular cavity dimension at the base when the heart contracts, just at the base. And that's what we call the fractional shortening. So you can, you, you, there are two methods to, 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 to evaluate fractional shortening. You have the M-mode method and the two-dimensional method. I know we have not discussed M-mode, but still going to sh uh, show you guys. And when we do M-mode as a, as a lecture, it will be more apparent. So what we do... So this is not a volumetric measurement. It's just a linear measurement. It's not a volumetric measurement. So we measure the left ventricular cavity at end diastole. So the left ventricular end diastolic dimension. So we see how big the LV is. We just measure it. How big is the LV? And then in diastole, that is. And then in systole, we do the same thing. How big is the LV uh, at the end uh, in that uh, systole. So we get those measurements. So the fractional shortening is the left ventricular end diastolic dimension in diastole. That's when the heart is fully uh, enlarged. And then we subtract from that the left ventricular end systolic dimension. And we divide by the left ventricular end diastolic dimension times 100, fractional shortening. For M, if you're using M mode to Look at fractional shortening, the normal value should be above 25%. So anything less than 25% suggests LV systolic dysfunction, a reduction in your systolic function. And this is how it's done. So I know this doesn't look like much, but you know, when you do two-dimensional echo, so when you do M mode echo, you have your two-dimensional image on top. 
two-dimensional image on top. And we did scan in view, so you should quickly recognize that this is a parasternal long axis view. Parasternal long axis view. You have your chest wall, then you have the pericardium, then the RV wall, the RV cavities right there. This is your septum, ventricular septum. You have your LV cavity, the posterior wall. Below the posterior wall, you have your pericardium. This is the mitral valve, the anterior leaflet, the posterior leaflet is right there. This is your left atrium, your aortic valve leading to the aorta. So this, this cursor, this cursor crosses a number of structures. And that is and that's what you're looking at down here. So this is this is what we call your M mode image. And of course, because the cursor looks at each structure and represents it here, you have the chest wall, you have the pericardium, you have the RV wall, the RV cavity, the septum, the LV cavity, and the posterior wall down there, and the pericardium outside that. Again, you don't have to fully understand this because we have a separate lecture for that. So this is uh, in systole, the walls of the heart moves in. And you can see that, you know, this is the apex. The, the apex moves down towards the posterior wall and the posterior wall moves up towards the apex. Where they're closest together, that is uh, end, end systolic dimension. When they're closest together, that's end systolic dimension. And when they're further apart, that is your end diastolic dimension. So what I'm saying to you, fractional shortening is the left ventricular end diastolic dimension minus your left ventricular end systolic dimension over your left ventricular end diastolic dimension. For M mode, it should be greater than 25%. You can also do the same thing using two-dimensional echo. Uh, so it is the percentage change in the left ventricular cavity dimensions at the base with contraction. So it's, a, it, it, it's an assessment of a systolic function, how well the heart is contracting. And for M mode, the normal value is, uh, is greater than 18%. The same definition, left ventricular end diastolic dimension in diastole, minus left ventricular end systolic dimension, okay, divided by left ventricular end diastolic dimension times 100%, times 100%. All right, so this is, so this is your M mode, sorry, this is your two-dimensional echo again, two-dimensional echo, chest wall is right up here, okay, then you get to the pericardium, then the RV wall, this is your RV cavity, this is the ventricular septum, LV cavity, posterior wall, posterior mitral leaflet, anterior mitral leaflet, left atrium, aortic valve, and the aortic root going into the ascending aorta. Okay. This is a, a diastolic frame because the, the, the mitral valve is open, diastolic frame. So this is, and you, you do your measurements at the tip of the mitral leaflet. This is your left ventricular end diastolic dimension. So it is, and again, it is done at the onset of the QRS complex. The measurement is done at the onset of the QRS complex. Your, your ECG is on the bottom. So you just put your marker right at the onset of Q, the QRS. The mitral valve will be open at the tip of the mitral leaflet. You're going to measure from the septum to the posterior wall. That's your left ventricle and diastolic dimension. And you do the same thing for systole, okay? Systole is at the peak of the T wave. In systole, the aortic valve is open, the mitral valve is closed at the tip of the mitral leaflet from the septum to the posterior wall. That is your left ventricular end systolic dimension. And the definition for fractional shortening is your left ventricular end diastolic dimension minus your left ventricular end systolic dimension divided by the left ventricular end di diastolic dimension. Okay, so, so 
you know straightforward i think um you have to 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 get good measurements for it to be valid and again for m mode should be greater than 25 percent for two-dimensional echo it should be greater than 18 percent all right so from the definition of fractional shortening we use the base so what about the apex you, you can have a heart where the apex is is akinetic so you know so it's not a true representation of how well the heart is contracting so quinone came up with with, with a method another method uh, the, the, the simplified quinone method to evaluate uh, ejection fraction. And again, we don't use this in clinical practice, but it appears on your exam, so you need to know, you know how it's done. So again, when we evaluate ejection fraction or fractional shortening using uh, this method, we just look at the base of the heart, okay? The apex of the heart, which is someplace out there, we totally ignore it. So quinone, for the simplified quinone uh, method, they have a correctional factor for, for the apex, but quinone actually use the area. So quinone use the area as opposed to just linear measurements. So what quinone did to get the ejection fraction squared the left ventricle end diastolic dimension, squared the left ventricle end systolic dimension, and you're gonna divide by your end diastolic dimension squared. So it's, it's, it's an area he, that, that he used. So left ventricle end diastolic dimension squared minus the left ventricle end systolic dimension squared divided by left ventricle end diastolic dimension squared. And you multiply by 100 and you had a correction uh, factor for apical contraction. So you're going to have a correction uh, factor for apical contraction. What Quinone uh, stated was that if your apex is normal, so when you do your apical four chamber view, if the apex is normal, you had 10%. If the apex is hypokinetic, you had 5%. If the apex is akinetic, zero. If it's dyskinetic, minus five. And if it's aneurysmal, you know, subtract 10%. Okay, before the, the end of the session, we'll go over what a normal uh, myocardium is, what a hypokinetic myocardium is, what an akinetic myocardium is, what dyskinetic mean, and what aneurysmal mean. So you'll get a fully full understanding of these terms. So again, simplify quinone methods. You square the dimensions, okay? So it's square the dimensions. So the left ventricle and diastolic dimension squared minus left ventricle and systolic dimension squared, uh, and then you square the left ventricle and diastolic dimension. So right away you can see that you're going to have a dimension squared. Uh, in the numerator, the denominator, your dimension square. So your dimension going to cancel out each other. Okay. So, and then of course you, your, your apical correction uh, factor. If it's normal, ten percent. If it's hypokinetic, five. Akinetic, zero. Dyskinetic, minus five. And aneurysmal, minus ten. All right. So we have done three methods so far, looking at the contraction of the heart, how well the heart is contracting. We talk about ejection fraction, fractional shortening, and the, the simplified quinone method. Now the fourth method is your mitral E-point septal separation. And this, this is a quick uh, look to see if the heart is contracting very well. And it's best to use multiple methods to, 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 to determine whether the heart is contracting very well. Multiple methods, I mean, because they should be concordant. They should, they should give you the same information. 
okay? So the, the mitral valve E-point septal separation, it can be used to classify the LV ejection fraction as either normal or reduced. You can't give an exact number, but you can say the ejection fraction is normal or the ejection fraction is reduced. And the normal E-point septal separation is about eight to 10 millimeters, okay? Anything great, you know, try to simplify things because you're going to get a lot of information. So anything greater than 10 millimeters suggests reduced LV ejection fraction. Okay. And this is how it's done. Again, so you, this is the M mode on the bottom, two-dimensional echo on top. Again, don't get too frustrated that you, you know, this M mode thing looks, you know, M mode is actually relatively easy but you have to be you have to have a proper introduction to m mode to, to fully understand what it means um so don't get discouraged uh so this is your your two-dimensional echo is on top two-dimensional echo and the m mode images on the bottom okay again you have a cursor right there that's what they 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 the, the image is going to be, the, the image that depicted here uh, is from what the, where, where you put your cursor. So these are the structures that the M mode will, will be looking at. Again, you're going to encounter your chest wall. Uh, below the chest wall, you're going to have your pericardium, the RV wall below that, RV cavity, which is right there, your septum, ventricular septum, LV cavities right there, posterior wall, pericardium below that. So those are the structures that the, the, the cursor is looking at. This is the mitral valve, the anterior leaflet, posterior leaflet. So the cursor crosses through these structures. So the structures that are depicted here is exactly what the cursor um, is looking at. So the chest wall, then you get to the RV wall, you know, pericardium first, then the RV wall. Then the RV cavity is right there. This is your septum, septum. And then your LV cavity is right here, but there's some structure inside your LV cavity. And if you look, the structure is the mitral valve. The cursor crosses through the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, then the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve. So this structure inside the LV cavity here is the mitral valve. Of course, your ECG is on top. You always have your ECG. If you look closely at the ECG, if you can see the ECG clearly, you can see that this represents diastole, okay, from the, the end of the T wave to the beginning of the QRS. This little portion here is systole. This is diastole, and this is systole. The mitral valve opens in diastole. And when the mitral valve opens, it opens, it looks like this, okay? The mitral valve closes in systole. And we name these points. We name these points. And again, we have a separate lecture to go over this. Don't get discouraged. This is the point we call the D point, which is right there. This is when the mitral valve opens. This is the E point, okay, when you have rapid filling in the LV. And this is your F point. Okay, this is your A point and your C point. Okay, but the mitral, the essential thing is that the mitral valve opens in diastole. Again, this is the E point. So we talk about the E point septal separation. The normal, if the ejection fraction is normal, this E point should be almost touching the septum. Okay, this is the septum, this is the E point. Okay, again, I said this is a D point, E point, F point, A point, C point. So your E point should be actually touching the septum. If it's, if it's greater than 10 millimeters or one centimeter, it suggests that the ejection fraction is reduced. So your E point, septum, E point, septum, and you can see the separation. I mean, you don't have to do any measurement. You can see the septum is way up there. This E point is way down there. So you, 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 you just assume that 
this ejection fraction is going to be reduced. All right. So that's your E point septal separation. Now, you know, when we look at the heart, when we look at the heart, I mean, you know, I tell you, this is the septum, this is the anterior wall, uh, this is the inferior wall, the posterior wall, but you have to, and this is going to take a little getting used to, but you have to divide the, the, the heart into what we call regional walls or regional segments. You have to divide the heart into segments because the, 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 blood, si the blood supply to the heart uh, is sort of unique. And if you know which segment is involved in a disease process, you can you can you can identify the blood vessel that is 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 causing that problem so dividing the heart into regional walls is very important to, especially when we're talking about a heart attack when we talk about a myocardial infarction by just looking at the wall that is involved you can automatically say well this is a right coronary artery occlusion it's a left anterior descending coronary artery occlusion or it's a circumflex occlusion. So, you know, those of, uh, those of us who do uh, intervention, we can prepare ourselves because if we know it's a LAD, a left anterior descending coronary artery that's occluded, you know, we prepare ourselves for that. If it's a right coronary artery, then we can pre prepare ourselves for that. So when we do... Uh, or cardiac catheterization and our angiograms, we go in with a sense of what to expect. So, so regional walls are very, very important. And we divide the heart into 16 or 17 segments. So at this time, you should know the different views. And that's why we went over scanning views. Okay. Um, so let me see if i can um simplify it before all right let me see if i can simplify it all right so let's look at the apex of the heart so you know how to get the apex of the heart okay and when you get the apex of the heart okay so you know how to image and get the apex of the heart when you get the apex of the heart, the apex of the heart looks something like this. Okay, so the apex of the heart looks something like that. And, you know, the top of the top of the, 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 the structure is what we call the anterior wall. The bottom is what we call the inferior wall. And to the side, this is the lateral wall. And this is what we call the septum. So we actually divide the apex of the heart into four segments. So this is our apex. It's very important to get this because you'll get it in your exams. And, you know, when you're reporting, you have to report in a fashion that people understand what's going on. So this is the apex. The apex is divided into four segments. Okay. So this is the anterior wall. This is your inferior wall. This is the lateral wall. And this is your septum. Apex divided into four segments. Then remember, 
when you move from the apex short axis view, move from the apex, you get to the mid cavitary level where you have the papillary muscles, right? So let's draw that. Well, you can also show that it's the popular muscles that you have. Popular muscles are a little out pouching. Okay, it's the popular muscles. Your, la your anterior lateral and your posterior medial popular muscle. So this is the mid level. You have to divide the heart into segments. So this is the mid segment, that's not, that's not a P, that's a D. All right, so we divide the, 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 the mid cavitary level of the LV into six segments. But remember, lateral wall is over here, your septum is over here, the anterior wall is up top, and the inferior wall is down the bottom. But we divide that into six segments. So how you name these segments, this is the anterior wall, you know that. Anterior wall. This is the inferior wall. And where you have the lateral wall, you have an anterior lateral wall up top because it's closest to the anterior wall. So the anterior lateral wall and this is your inferior lateral wall, because it's closest to the inferior. And then over the septum, you have the same thing, your anterior septum, but that's the portion that's closest to the anterior wall. Anterior septum, that's a S, just assume it's a S. And then, this is your an, your inferior septal, okay? Inferior septal, inferior septal. Please do not memorize this. You have to know it, okay? So the anterior wall, inferior wall, where you have the lateral wall, closest to the anterior wall is your anterior lateral wall. Closest to the inferior wall, you have an inferior lateral wall. Over the septum, closest to the anterior wall, you have an anterior septum. Closest to the inferior wall, you have inferior septum. So at the mid cavitary level, six segments. So your apex is four segments. Mid cavitary level, six segments. And then at the base, Remember the basis where you have your mitral valve, the short axis we're talking about. The basis where you have the mitral valve. Okay. Again, we divide the base into six segments. So the base is where you have the mitral valve. Okay, you have the mitral valve in the base. Okay, you divide the base into six segments. 
Okay, and just like that, the mid cavitary level, you have the anterior wall or anterior segment. You have the inferior segment. And over the lateral wall side, you have your anterior lateral wall. You have your inferior lateral wall. Over the septum, you have your anterior septum. And here you have your inferior septum. So six segments. Okay, so you have six plus six, that's 12, and 14, that's 16. So you have 16 segments. Again, remember the, the, the rationale for, for dividing the heart into segments is because of the blood supply, the blood flow to the heart. Because if you do your echo and you see just these areas that are hypokinetic or akinetic, you know which blood vessel is involved, okay? All right, so, but we also, we also use the, 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 the apical uh, four-chamber view, and we can also use the apical two-chamber view, and even the, the apical three-chamber view, and also divide those into segments as well. All right, um, so, all right, let's see what I can do. All right, so if you have your apical four chamber, I'm just gonna draw the LV. All right, so your, this is your apical four chamber view. I'm just, just singling out the LV. So you know, so this is just the LV I, I, I took out. Of course, you're gonna have your, RV right here. Okay, you have your RV right there. All right, so this is the apex, okay? The apex, remember this is your septum right there. Septum is right there, and this is the lateral wall. We can do the same thing. We can divide this, let's do the lateral wall. We can divide the lateral wall into into three segments, as a matter of fact. So, so this would be your basal lateral wall, basal lateral wall. So this down here is the basal lateral wall. This would be your mid lateral wall. And then this segment is your apical lateral wall. Okay, so the lateral wall, we can divide just the lateral wall into three segments, basal, mid, apical. So this is actually your true apex. This is the apex of the heart right there. So the, the, the septum, we can do the same thing for the septum. We can divide it into three segments. Okay, so this would be your basal septum. Okay, so the first segment is the basal septum. The next one will be your mid septum. And this one will be your apical septum. So this is your apical septum. Okay. So we can divide our LV or left ventricle into six segments, looking at the lateral wall, 
and the septum, okay? Basal lateral wall, mid lateral wall, apical lateral wall. And then for your septum, you have your basal, mid, and apical septum. You can also do the same thing for your two chamber view. So you can divide your two chamber view into six segments as well. Okay, so remember when you do your two chamber view, apical two chamber view, this is your anterior wall. So in the apical two chamber view, this is the anterior wall up here, and this is the inferior wall down there. So you can divide it into six segments just as well. So one there. And then the anterior wall, you can divide it into three segments as well. Okay, so if you look at your inferior wall, this would be your inferior basal wall or basal inferior wall. Basal inferior wall. So basal inferior wall. This would be your mid inferior wall. And then this would be your apical inferior wall. The whole thing is your inferior wall. Okay, so your anterior wall is over here. So this is your basal anterior wall. This would be your mid anterior wall. And then this is your 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 uh, your apical anterior wall. Apical anterior wall. So you should memorize it. Okay. You need to 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 be able to just sit down and draw it because it's 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 logical. Okay. So. Uh, the, the lowermost portion is the basal portion. Then you have the mid segment and the apical segment. This is the anterior wall, so it's the basal anterior, it's the mid apical anterior, and then you, you talk about the apical cap. And so, so when you're doing stress echo, you know the, it, it's very important to the, divide the, the heart into to, to segments as well. So, you know when we're talking about coronary artery distribution, yes, you know, heart attack, uh, ischemia, it's important to, to, to refer to the segments. So in the apical four chamber view, this is six segments, and then this is another six segment. So you need to, uh, we're gonna go over the coronary distribution to the different segments. What I mean by that, the coronary artery blood supply to the different segments. Just a rough uh, thing, the anterior wall and a portion of the septum is usually, is usually supplied by the LAD, the left anterior descending coronary artery. Usually supply the anterior wall and probably the anterior septum. The lateral wall, is usually the circumflex or, or what we call um, a branch of the LAD, the circumflex or the branch of the LAD. And then the inferior wall is usually the right coronary artery. So just a, a rough thing. So again, the anterior wall, usually the LAD. Um, uh, the inferior wall is usually the, the right coronary artery. Okay, all right. When the heart, the normal heart, when it contracts, it thickens. 
the normal heart, when it contracts, it thickens. That's what it's supposed to do. When there is a blockage, a significant obstruction to one of the blood vessels around the heart, coronary arteries, one of the first things that you're going to get is a, a, a lack of thickening. The heart muscle is not going to thicken. So the normal heart muscle thickens. If there is a reduction in the blood flow to that, to that heart muscle, you're going to get a reduction in the thickening. If that heart muscle dies, then it's not going to thicken at all. And if it, if it not only dies, but it thins, you can get what we call a dyskinetic motion. That means instead of when it contracts, it comes in, it actually moves in the opposite direction. That's what we call dyskinesis. And then it may even be aneurysmal. If it dies, it thins, and it's been pulled and stretched by the adjacent normal segment, then it, it, it remains bulge. It's going to bulge in both systole and diastole. So it's, it's very important to, to, to know what we mean by normal what we mean by uh, hypokinesis or hypokinetic, uh, akinetic, uh, dyskinesis, and aneurysmal. Okay, all right, so you, we went over the segment. So let me, at this point, I'm going to take away this drawing, and then this is a much neater representation. So the apex, again, the apex, you have an anterior wall, inferior wall, lateral wall, septum, six segments. The mid-cavitary level, okay, lateral wall, septum, anterior wall, inferior wall. But the septum is divided into an anterior septum and an inferior septum. Sorry, the lateral wall, anterior lateral, and an inferior lateral. The septum, anterior septum, inferior septum, okay, mid cavitary. At the base, so at the mid cavity, you have the popular muscles, okay, the anterior lateral popular muscle, the posterior medial popular muscles. Then at the, the base, where you have your, your, your valve, your mitral valve, the same six segments, okay, you have the anterior wall, inferior wall, over the lateral wall, you have your anterior lateral and inferior lateral. In the septum, you have your anterior septum and your inferior septum. So again, when you get the four chamber view, okay, you we talk about the apical cap, okay, uh, very important when you're doing stress echo. And then the lateral wall, you have your basal uh, uh, lateral wall, um, you have your mid lateral wall, apical lateral wall, and then the septum, you have the basal, mid, and apical for the Two chamber view, okay. The anterior wall is here and the inferior wall is right there. So you have your basal anterior wall, mid anterior wall, apical anterior wall, and then the inferior wall, the same thing basal, mid, and apical. And this is your apical three chamber view where this is actually your anterior septum right there and this is your inferior lateral wall. So the same thing basal, mid, apical basal mid apical so apart from the apex all the others have uh six segments and to, for, for the short axis this is how you cut in the heart you cut in the heart like this so you see so you saw a bread loaf in the heart and that's how you're looking at it you look at the apex you look at the mid and then the basal for for the long axis then you, you actually cut it um you know, like this, you cut it this way, all right? Um, all right, so the same thing, and you can do the same thing if you're doing the parasternal uh, long axis, where you have, you know, where you have the, 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 the septum, you can do it into basal and mid, the, 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 the parasternal long axis, you, you don't have an apex. You're not supposed to get an apex in the parasternal long axis. If you get an apex in the parasternal long axis, you're shortening the, 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 the image. But again, when you do your short axis, we talk about the apex. You have four uh, segments at the base and the mid-level, six segments. Okay? Um, 
for the apical views again the four chamber view you have six segments we went over that two chamber view you have six segments and a three chamber view you also have six segments so a normal segment have normal motion and normal thickening thickening is the most important thing when we talk about uh, a normal myocardial function thickening a normal heart muscle is going to thicken if you have reduced blood supply to that segment it's going to not thicken and thicken as much it's not going to thicken as much if you have infarction to that segment that means that heart muscle dies it's going to be akinetic it's not going to thicken at all and then if it's it can be dyskinetic if it thins okay so these are the, the 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 things that you need to know when we talk about a normal segment we we score it so we talk about a wall motion score and we also go on to talk about a wall motion score index but when we talk about a wall motion score a normal score that when you look at the muscle it thickens and moves normal it get a score of one when it's hypokinetic that means it's not thickening as well okay and the motion may be reduced you get a score of two if it's akinetic that means it's not thickening at all and there's no motion even if there's motion because you can have motion you can have motion without thickening and you know so don't just use motion because a, a, a dead segment can be pulled by normal segment and it may have what looks like normal motion but the thickening is a key a dead muscle is not going to thicken okay so a kinetic uh, a kinetic segment gets a score of three dyskinetic segment gets a four a score of four and an aneurysmal segment get a score of five so we talk about a wall motion score index. What you're gonna do, we use a 16 segment uh, for this. So you're gonna look at 16 segments and you're gonna score it. So you can, so you can take, uh, so any 16 segments, you can use your short axis, uh, you know, customer to use probably the, 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 the mid and the basal short axis along with the, apical four chamber view you know that give you um uh that will give you 16 segments okay so or you can you can sorry you can you can use your you can use your 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 you can co just combine the, the different segments until you get 16. so you can use your your apical two along with your your short axis so you you need a total of 16 segments and you're gonna sit down and you're gonna score each segment so if all the segments are normal that is good motion normal thickening so it will be 16 times one divided by 16 to get the score index so to get the wall motion score index is the sum of the sum of the wall motion scores divided by the number of segments so you all we use 16 segments so the number of segments is going to be 16. you're going to look at each segment and you're going to score it where one is normal two is hypokinetic three akinetic four dyskinetic and five is aneurysmal so you're going to score it if if all if you look at 16 segments and all all the segments are hypokinetic then it will be 16 times 2 which is 32 divided by the number of segments so the wall motion score index is 2. you only use 17 segments if you add in the the, the apical cap okay all right so this is a definition of the terms and these are strict definition, so you can use your definition. A normal, a normal wall, a normal muscle have normal thickening. The motion may or may not be normal, but the thickening is the important thing.
a hypokinetic segment of decreased thickening. And you remember, the thickening is in systole. In systole, you're supposed to get normal thickening. And, you know, you may have normal motion. If it's akinetic, you have absence of thickening. So akinesis means the absence of thickening. Most people put absence of motion. No, that's not what it's, it, it's, that's not the definition. It's an absence of thickening. And then what we say, if it's dyskinetic, then you have a paradoxical uh, motion. So in systole, when it's supposed to come in, it actually moves in the opposite direction. So dyskinetic. And then aneurysmal is if, you, you know, when you have diastolic def uh, deformation, thinning and bulging. So whether it's a systole or diastole, you get bulging. Okay, so these are the classic definition of the terms. Okay, and I am gonna leave the polar plot uh, and because it, it's very important to tie up all of these. It's extremely important. So, because, when we report echo findings today, we usually use polar plot to, to it's a simple it's a simple way of giving you a lot of information. And it's a simple thing, you know. They, they, this inner portion is the apex. This, this, this is the apical cap inside there. But this is the, the apex where you have four segments. Now you can see you have four segments, anterior, inferior, septum, lateral wall. The next outer shell is the mid uh, level. And you have six segments, anterior, inferior, inferior lateral, anterior lateral, anterior septum, inferior septum. And then this outer shell is the, the, the base, six segments as well, anterior, inferior, inferior lateral, uh, anterior lateral, anterior septum, inferior septum. But we, so so this is what we, what we call a polar plot. When you put everything together and you can determine if a segment is is hypokinetic, is it normal, whatever. You know, we, we did, a lot of reporting is done using polar plots. So we're gonna spend a little time going over this in our next session. So I'm not gonna do it here. And then we're just going to tie.